Okay, so we've come to the conclusion of all our CEP conference. And uh, what better way to conclude than to, again, let God have the last word. And we would like to invite Dr. Carson to share God's word with us. Thank you. Now, I was assigned... Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 30 and following. But I confess I'm going to be slightly naughty because chapter 31 is found in a larger section, chapter 30 to 33. And when we have covered so little of such a big book, I thought it might be useful to talk at least for a few moments about how this nestles into the argument in the entire book. But we'll begin by reading chapter 31, verse 29 to the end of the chapter. Chapter 31, 29 to the end of the chapter. Then I'll lead in prayer, and then we'll go back to chapter 30. That's a bit confusing. We read now 31, 29 and following, and then we'll go back to chapter 30. In those days, people will no longer say, the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Instead, everyone will die for their own sin. Whoever eats sour grapes, their own teeth will be set on edge. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. This is what the Lord says. He who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord Almighty is his name. Only if these decrees vanish from my sight, declares the Lord, will Israel ever cease being a nation before me. This is what the Lord says. Only if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below be searched out, will I reject all the descendants of Israel because of all they have done, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when this city will be rebuilt for me from the tower of Hananel to the corner gate. The measuring line will stretch from there straight to the hill of Gareb and then turn to Goa. The whole valley where dead bodies and ashes are thrown and all the terraces out to the Kidron Valley on the east as far as the corner of the horse gate will be holy to the Lord. The city will never again be uprooted or demolished. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our sight be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Through Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. I was brought up in French Canada. Canada is a big country, something like 4,500 miles wide, 7,000 kilometers. It's a big country. I was brought up in French Canada, and if you drive west on the Trans-Canada Highway from where I grew up, after 15 or 1,600 miles, let's say 25, 2,600 kilometers, after you've passed through Ontario and all those glorious old mountains north of Lake Superior, you come eventually to Winnipeg in Manitoba. That's the last significant city before you hit the Great Plains. From there to Calgary, Alberta is 800 miles, let's say 1,300 kilometers, 1,400 kilometers. The first 40 miles are the flattest land I have seen everywhere, anywhere in God's green earth. I mean flat. No trees, nothing. 
no gentle undulations, just flat. It's the flattest flat you've ever seen anywhere. If you dropped a marble on it, it wouldn't roll. There's no down. There's no up. There's no sideways. There's just flat. And then after that first 40 miles, it's still flat, just not quite as flat. And that goes on all the way to Calgary, Alberta. It's the Great Plains. We grow a lot of wheat, but there's not a mountain in sight. Then you get to Calgary, and you look out and see the beginnings of the Rocky Mountains. Now, when you look at a big map of North America, Canada's up this part. The U.S. is down this part. And Mexico's down on that part. In Canada, you go a long, 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 long way before you get to the Rocky Mountains. But when you get to them, they're alpine. They're very high. They're skiing mountains. And then when you move to the States instead, the Rocky Mountains go a lot farther east. They start a lot sooner. But they're not nearly as good. They've been squashed down somehow. If you want to see real mountains, you go to the Rockies in Canada. Do you, do you see? And if you want to see squashed down mountains for a longer piece of time, then you go to the U.S. I speak without bias here. <laughs> so you're setting out for the Rocky Mountains in Canada, and you're 80 miles away from the foothills. And you can see them in the distance. But as you see them, you see hills, and not quite such tall hills, and then bigger hills, and, and then the snow capped hills of Banff and so on. You can see them all as you approach. But what you can't see as you approach is what distance there is between the first range of mountains and the second range and the third range. Do you, do you see? It all gets flattened out because of the distance. You don't know how much distance there is between the first range and the second range or between the second range and the third range. From a distance, it's just all there. That's the way a great deal of Old Testament prophecy is put together. When Old Testament prophets look to the future, they may be seeing the return from exile. They may be seeing the coming of the Messiah. They may be seeing the consummation and the new heaven and the new earth. Now, from a distance, it all gets flattened out. And you can comment on this bit and that bit and the other bit without being able to see very clearly that there are large gaps between the first bit and the second bit and the second bit and the third bit. Do you, do you, do you see? That's very common uh, when you come to Old Testament prophetic literature that is actually forward-looking. Now, Jeremiah 30 to 33 constitutes a unit full of promise and hope in the prophecy of Jeremiah. It is the promise of recovery and restoration after the exile, but also of a lot more than the people had experienced before the exile. The previous blessings they had known will be entirely eclipsed in the splendor of God's lavish grace. Sometimes these chapters are referred to as the book of hope or the book of consolation. There are two dominant hopes. The hope of return to the land after the exile, and beyond that, hope for spiritual renewal bound up with the enactment of a promised new covenant. And even beyond that, the fulfillment of the new covenant in that which is at the very edge of the periphery of our vision. The past is not forgotten in these chapters. The sins and the judgments which are spectacularly displayed in the earliest chapters with astonishingly powerful and sometimes, frankly, rude and vulgar metaphors, I'll draw your attention to some of them in a few moments, have been too deep, too awful, too wretched to ignore. But now there is life and hope because of what God himself will do. Now, obviously, we don't have the time to work through all of chapters 30 to 33. But although I will focus on 30 and 31, I'll skip through 30 really quickly, and the first half of 31 very quickly, until we come to the New Covenant text itself. But it is helpful to see how you're looking at this range of mountains uh, before you come to the particular peak to which we want to draw attention. So, first of all, God promises to restore the people to the land, chapter 30, 
and then God promises to restore the, restore the people to himself, chapter 31. So first, God promises to restore the people to the land, chapter 30. The introduction, verses 1 to 3, instructs Jeremiah to write a book. Now usually the prophets gave oracles. And these were collected sometimes by the prophet himself and sometimes by one or more of his disciples. Think of Isaiah 8:16. Bind up the testimony and seal up the law among my disciples. But in Jeremiah, writing is extraordinarily important, as it is in Moses. And Baruch the scribe has to take down what Jeremiah says, and he has got it from God. There are 14 oracles in chapters 30 to 33, and they're centered on restoration. Verse 3, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will bring my people Israel and Judah back from captivity and restore them to the land I gave their ancestors to possess, says the Lord. Now, this is going to go too quickly, but let me outline for you chapter 30 so that you can see the progress of thought. Number one, God will break the yoke of enemy oppressors, verses 4 to 9. Number two, God will be with his people and save them. That word save is used repeatedly. That is, he will save them out of a distant place. He will bring them back. Thus, chapter 30, verses 10 and 11. Do not be afraid, Jacob, my servant. Do not be dismayed, Israel declares the Lord. I will surely save you out of a distant place, your descendants from the land of their exile. Jacob will again have peace and security. No one will make them afraid, and so on. Number three, God will restore their health. The word health is used, but in the sweeping context of verses 12 to 17, it's national health, it's spiritual health, it's economic health, it's the health of the vineyard and so forth. God will restore their health, verses 12 to 17. Hence, verse 17, I will restore you to health and heal your wounds, declares the Lord. Because you are called an outcast, Zion for whom no one cares. And finally, God will restore their honor, verses 18 to 22. I will restore the fortunes of Jacob's tent and have compassion on his dwellings. The city will be rebuilt on her ruins. The palace will stand in its proper place. From them will come songs of thanksgiving and the sound of rejoicing. I will add to their numbers and so on. And thus the conclusion in verse 22, so you will be my people and I will be your God. And all of this is certain, guaranteed, absolutely reliable, verses 23 to 24. So that's chapter 30. That is to say, God restores the nation to the land. Then God promises to restore the people to himself, chapter 31. This is even better news. Because after all, at the end of the day, it's more fundamental. If you're restored to the land but not restored to God, all you're doing is setting yourself up for another round of exile. And the two restorations are not entirely separate, as we shall see. So, number one, God restores his people to himself because as the father of his people, he has loved them from eternity. Chapter 31, verses 1 to 9. Let me repeat that. God restores his people to himself because as the father of his people, he has loved them from eternity. Verses 1 to 9. Now, there are some wonderful metaphors in this passage. I have time to mention only one or two. Those of you who have read the earlier chapters of Jeremiah carefully will remember that in chapters 3 and 4, um, the sin of God's people is portrayed as a kind of spiritual adultery. Apostasy is often portrayed as spiritual adultery, and the language is grotesque. The only book that makes it even more grotesque is Ezekiel. Read Ezekiel 16 and, and 23. There the argument is the older sister was a prostitute, sold herself to every pagan god that came along. And the, the younger sister, Judah, uh, a little later to be punished, but, but even worse, because she saw what happened to the older sister and went and chose exactly the same path herself. 
And th the language is grotesque. This habit of using prostitution as a kind of metaphor for spiritual adultery starts as early as Deuteronomy, and it shows up in many, many contexts in the Old Testament. Most remarkably, perhaps, in the prophecy of Hosea, where God himself is portrayed as the almighty cuckold. And behind all of this is the constant running theme in the Old Testament, God is the husband and Israel is his bride. Israel is his wife. And instead of building a wonderful relationship, the bride is slutting around and all forms of idolatry are viewed as a kind of spiritual, uh, all, all forms of apostasy are viewed as a kind of spiritual adultery. So both Israel and Judah have been dismissed now, out of hand. They're wretched prostitutes. And now what do we read? Verse 4 of chapter 31, I will build you up again and you, virgin Israel, will be rebuilt. What? Virgin Israel? How do you turn a prostitute into a virgin? This is stronger language than I will restore the years, the locusts of Eden. Because at least in that imagery, the years have been eaten, but you get some sort of restoration afterwards. But here you're using a mixture of metaphors which, at the literal level, make no sense at all. How do you turn a prostitute into a virgin? But that's the language that the prophet dares use. And more than once. In case we've missed it, it comes up a little later in the same chapter. He restores. He heals. He transforms. He makes pure what is dirty. And he does this with a mixed metaphor. He's the father. He's the father who loves his own people. All of this, he says, I will do, verse 9, because I am Israel's father, and Ephraim is my firstborn son, piling on one metaphor on another metaphor. So God restores his people to himself because as the father of his people, he has loved them from eternity. Number two. God restores his people to himself because as the shepherd of his flock, he ransoms them and redeems them from those stronger than they are, verses 10 to 14. He restores his people to himself because as the shepherd of his flock, he ransoms them and redeems them from those stronger than they are. Here, the language purposely switches over to the pastoral side of things. Hear the word of the Lord, you nations, proclaim it in distant coastlands. He who scattered Israel will gather them and will watch over his flock like a shepherd. So again, the young of the flocks and herds he will look after, verse 12. So now God the shepherd gathers his people to himself. Here is shepherd language that is often used for God in the Old Testament. It's what lies behind the spectacular poetry of Psalm 33. At the same time, this book denounces the false shepherds of Israel again and again. So does, for example, the prophecy of Ezekiel, verse 34, where repeatedly God says, I am against the shepherds of Israel. They fleece the flock, they eat the mutton, but they don't look after the sheep. And after denouncing them again and again, he says, I will shepherd my people Israel. I will lead them to green pasture. I will bring them to clear water. I will separate the sheep from the goats. About 25 times, God himself says, I will shepherd them. And then he says, I will send my servant David to shepherd them. It's another one of those Old Testament passages where there is an intentional confusion between God himself and the great David who is to come. So when we come to the New Testament and we hear Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd. It's very difficult not to see the connection between Psalm 23 and Ezekiel 34 and a, a host of other passages in which God is the ultimate shepherd of the sheep and he's not like the hirelings who come along and fleece the flock. He is the good shepherd. He rescues them. Number three, God restores his people to himself because as the God of compassion, he takes on the desperate state of his people. He restores the people to himself because as the God of compassion, he takes pity on the desperate state of his people, verses 15 to 22. 
Let me draw your attention to just a detail or two. 15, this is what the Lord says. A voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Now, those of you who know your Bibles will remember that those are the words quoted in Matthew 1 and 2. What is going on? Rachel, of course, was the second wife of Jacob and the mother of Judah and Benjamin and therefore of Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim, verse 18 here, was the largest of the tribes in the north. And so sometimes it was used to refer to the entire northern kingdom, equivalent to Israel. Rama here is where Rachel was buried, about five miles to the north of Jerusalem on the border between north and south. Her children, we're told, are no more. We would say Rachel is turning over in her grave. She's weeping in her grave because her offspring have been taken away. They're no more. They've been banished. They've gone off in the exile. They're facing judgment. So when these words are picked up by Matthew, insisting that they're finally fulfilled in Jesus' day at the slaughter of the innocents, when again the voice of mothers, like Rachel, is heard amidst the tears in the land as their babies are slaughtered. It's a way of saying there is a sense in which the exile continues. They're still under the judgment of God. Children and babies, the children of Rachel, the children of the mothers of Israel are still being destroyed. Judgment still lies on the land. Here there is a fulfillment, not in the sense that this passage is referring exclusively to the tears that were shed at the slaughter of the innocents in Matthew 2, but rather in the sense that it's of the same species. It's part of the same drift. It's part of the same abandonment. It's part of the same exile. It's part of the same judgment, leaving the mothers weeping, turning over in their graves, as it were. But, verses 16 and 17, the children will return. There is hope for your descendants, declares the Lord. Your children will return to their own land. I have heard Ephraim's moaning. You disciplined me like an unruly calf. There's a kind of conversation that goes on now between God and Ephraim. I have heard Ephraim's mourning, God says. They reply, you won't, yes, you, you, you did discipline me like an unruly calf. I, I have been disciplined. Restore me, and I will return because you are the Lord my God. After I strayed, I repented. After I came to understand, I beat my breast. I was ashamed and humiliated because I bore the disgrace of my youth. And God responds graciously, patiently. Is not Ephraim my dear son, the child in whom I delight? Though I often speak against him, that is in judgment, I still remember him. Therefore my heart yearns for him. I have great compassion for him. Verses 21 to 22 mention virgin Israel again. Though formerly an adulteress and a prostitute, here she is restored. Turn, turn, return to your towns, for God is faithful even when they're not. Briefly in passing, I should mention that verse 22 is one of the most difficult passages to understand in all the prophecy of Jeremiah. How long will you wander, unfaithful daughter Israel? The Lord will create a new thing on earth. And then our translations vary. The woman will return to the man, or the woman will protect the man, it's literally the woman will encompass the man. Jerome, in the fourth century, thought this referred to the virginal conception of Christ. But it's very difficult to see that that's what's going on in this passage. Some take it to mean something like, God creates a new thing. He brings it about, like the new covenant in verses 31 and following that we'll turn to in a moment. Formerly, God encompassed Israel. Now when God brings about a new thing, 
Israel encompasses a man, the strong man, literally. He encompasses the strong man, that is God himself. And this becomes, on this interpretation, equivalent to sexual union. That is, it's the Old Testament equivalent of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Do you, do you see? Yahweh and, and, and his people are now in marital conjugation. It's possible, but it's hard to be sure. Others take verse 22, um, B, they take it to be sarcastic. As if God says, how long will you wander, unfaithful daughter Israel? And they reply with a certain kind of sarcasm, the Lord will create a new thing on earth, the woman will return to the man, yes, and pigs will fly. That's the notion that this interpretation reads. I'm inclined to think that of these three, though there are many others that are offered, the second is most probably right, but I acknowledge that it is a difficult verse to be certain about. In any case, in this third point, God restores his people to himself because as the God of compassion, he takes pity on the desperate state of his people. Number four, God restores his people to himself because as the God who releases his people from captivity, he ends their weariness and exhaustion, verses 23 to 26. And then pressing on further, number five, God restores his people to himself because as the Lord of history, he chooses to build them up and create a stable society, verses 27 to 28. Do you see how much of this is bound up with the establishing of the nation again? And then finally, number six, God restores his people to himself because, as the Lord of the covenant, he writes a new covenant. And now we finally get to the passage that I'm supposed to be focusing attention on. I think it's very helpful to begin not at verse 31, but at verse 29, where we find a proverb. The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Instead, everyone will die for their own sin. Whoever eats sour grapes, their own teeth will be set on edge. The days are coming, declares the Lord, and then that proverb is unpacked. Now, we'll see how this works out in a few moments. One brief detail. This new covenant is established, we're told, verse 31, with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. But, of course... A little farther on, the text makes clear that it's only with a remnant of the people of Judah and the people of Israel. I'll show you that reference in a few moments. And when you come to the New Testament, you cannot help but remember that although there is one olive tree, to use the language of Paul, in Romans chapter 11, some branches are broken off and others are grafted in. So that there is one locus to the people of God, but at the end of the day, some of the original branches are no longer there and some wild olive tree branches are grafted in. What you have to remember is that when you come to the New Testament, some references to Israel and to Jews are empirical. And some are clearly typological. And only the context will show you which is which. They're not universally one sort or another. Thus, for example... The great passage, Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 to 6, which almost establishes in Israel the privilege of being God's kingdom of priests, the wonderful, stellar opportunity and joy and privilege it actually is. It's picked up and applied both by Peter and by the book of Revelation to the church of Jesus Christ. In that case, Israel serves as a kind of type of the people of God. Do you, do you see? And yet, when you come to Romans 11, there is a distinction made between Israel and Gentiles. In that case, Israel is still referring to empirical Israel. So, my father, when I was a young man, kept trying to tell me a text without a context becomes a pretext for a proof text. If you want to find out how Israel is used in the New Testament, read the context. But nevertheless, here the focus is on both Israel and Judah as to say, all of God's people together. They went into exile separately, 
But now God's people come together as one people under the terms of this new covenant. The second fundamental question to ask is, what is meant by new? I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel. It has to be said that virtually all Old Testament interpreters don't treat this covenant as new, but as a renewal of the Old Covenant. The overwhelming majority of Old Testament commentaries argue along that line. It's new only, they say, in the sense that God's mercies are new every morning. They come to you freshly. But it's not cognitively, substantively new. In fact, there are many evangelicals who take that view as well. And there are some points of continuity, which we'll see in just a moment. But when God uses new here, he really does mean new. There are two reasons why you must come to this conclusion. Number one, because in this immediate context, a contrast is drawn between this covenant and the old covenant. I will make a new covenant. Verse 32, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors. So it behooves us, at some level or other, to figure out what is so new about it that it is differentiable from the old one, such that God can say it's not like the old one. But there is a second reason. And that's the way this text is read by the writer to the Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 8, this passage is quoted at length. Hebrews chapter 8 Verses 7 and following, God found fault with the people and said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors. The whole thing is quoted at great length. And then in chapter 8, 13, the last verse, the author draws his own conclusions. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And that which is obsolete is outdated and will soon disappear. So if some Old Testament scholar wants to come along and say, this really isn't a new covenant, it's merely a renewal of the old covenant, he doesn't have to argue with me, he's got to argue with God Almighty, as God has given his word in Hebrews chapter 8, 13. This verse is so structured and framed as a contrast with the old covenant that the old covenant is dismissed as, in principle, outdated. So this is written in the days of Jeremiah. Six centuries before Christ, six centuries before Jesus was born, already God himself was signaling that at some deep principial level, the old covenant was already obsolete. So it is a big mistake to try to say that what's in view here is merely the renewal of the old. It's something much deeper than that. So we must ask the question, what's new? And here the answer is subtle but important. Six steps and we're done. Number one. This new covenant establishes interior transformation. 33a. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Rather, verse 33, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. Number two, God will be their God and they will be his people. Now I'm going to take these two together. I will be their God, this text says, and they will be my people. Now, already I can hear what some of you are saying. Yeah, 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 that's what the text says, and it's part of this rubric of discussion, what's new, but doesn't God use that language elsewhere? It's, it's not as if God's saying this for the first time. Already, for example, in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 17, verse 7, I will establish my covenant. That's the Abrahamic covenant. About 1400 years earlier. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. Likewise in Exodus chapter 6 verse 7. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God, 
or again. Even in this book of Ezekiel that we've been reading, we already read in chapter 30, verse 22, so you will be my people and I will be your God. And if we continued through the New Testament, we'd eventually come to the book of Revelation, chapter 21, 22, the final revelation of the entire Bible, and there God says, once again, I will be your God, you will be my people. The same slogan is used again and again and again. So what's new? Doesn't this sound like the same thing? Well, the language is certainly the same thing. What's new? Again, context is almost everything. I will be their God, they will be my people in the context of the Abrahamic covenant. Promises someone who comes as the ultimate seed. Promises land to the Israelites, the children of Abraham. Promises seed through whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Once Sinai is given, I will be their God and they will be my people, that's established in the framework of the tabernacle in the desert. God won't reject his people, despite their sin, despite the golden calf. He will build his tabernacle right in the midst of the people, Three tribes in the north, three in the south, three in the east, three in the west. I will be their God. They will be my people. Now you have the language of the new covenant. And now it's divorced from tabernacle, temple reference. Rather in terms of this personal interior transformation. I will be their God. They will be my people. And by the time you get to the book of Revelation 21, 22, still, I will be their God and they will be my people. But in that context, he will so much be their God and they will so much be his people that there is no more death or sorrow or pain or sin. And we don't need the sun by day or the moon by night because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its sun. And we don't need a temple in that city because the whole temple is built like a cube, like the most holy place. In that context, I will be their God and they will be my people is the consummation of a long trajectory. Do you see what happens in so many of these slogans as they are? They, they are repeated expressions of the relationship between God and human beings is that although the words remain the same, the context shows that things are getting ratcheted up, ratcheted up ratchet it up, fulfilled if you like, until you finally come to the consummation. Now, we know that intrinsically elsewhere. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, oh that I may know him. And you want to say, come on, Paul, you already know him. But when he says, 310, oh that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, he, he knows that he knows God. But he wants to know him better. It, it, it's, it's to be ratcheted up. There's, there's more to come. And this more to come shows up not only in terms of the deepening experience of one particular apostle, but in the sweep of redemptive history across the entire Bible storyline. That's true of the first two of these new elements. Interior transformation. Well, of course, in some sense, there's interior transformation in the Old Testament. I will be their God, they will be my people. Well, that's also true in the Old Testament. It's true in Abraham's day, it's true in Moses' day. But it's ultimately, finally, surpassingly true in the new heaven and the new earth, the home of righteousness. It's of a piece. The same language is being used. The same formula, the same words. But you can't help but see that it's been ratcheted up to the intensity of perfection. Or again, in the third place, there will be an abolition of mediating teachers owing to a universal anointing. What do we read? No longer, verse 34, will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. The point is that under the old covenant structure, there were certain people, prof, prophets, priests, and kings, who had a mediating function. The function of the kings was so to rule under God as to preserve 
the covenant and advance the interests of the covenant God. The prophets were to declare the word of God. Thus they were saying to the people, know the Lord. And the priests, well, they had their sacrificial duties and the Levites their administrative duties, but, but they were supposed to live in the various villages of Israel and, and teach the law to the people. Their job was to say, know the Lord. So it's not too surprising that the vast majority of references in the Old Testament to the Spirit falling on people are in context where the Spirit falls on these priestly, kingly, prophetic mediators whose job it is to say, know the Lord, know the Lord. But in that day, under the terms of the new covenant, they will all know me from the least to the greatest. So in consequence, no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord. Now, don't misunderstand this passage. There is one particular context in the New Testament which has sometimes been abused. At the end of 1 John chapter 2, we read something extraordinarily interesting. John points out that some people in his day are claiming that they have an inside track with God. They have a special anointing. They have a special insight. Whether it's Gnostic or something else, it doesn't make much difference. I am writing these things, 1 John 2.26. I am writing to, to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing, that means by the Spirit, that you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. Do you see that line? But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it is taught you, remain in him. So I've read commentaries that say, here in this context, John is a hypocrite. He says, you don't need anybody to teach you. What he really means is, you don't need anyone to teach you except me. Because after all, what on earth is he doing but teaching them? And if I really think, you don't need anybody to teach you, what on earth did I fly all the way to Malaysia for? <laughs> Moreover, under the terms of the New Testament, there is a great deal of emphasis on pastor teachers. But if... John is alluding to this passage in Ezekiel, which I think is highly likely. He's not abolishing all teachers. He's abolishing all mediating teachers. You see, if you were truly called as a prophet, that didn't mean somebody else could volunteer and say, okay, it's my turn, I'll be a prophet now. If you were a king, you had to be a Davidide. If you were a priest, you had to come from the tribe of Levi. You had to come from the house of, David, of, of Aaron. This was not something that was appointed by democratic vote. There were certain people who were appointed. The Old Testament structure was a tribal, mediating sort of structure. That's the point, do you see, of the proverb in verses 29 and 30. The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. But under the terms of the new covenant, everyone will die for their own sins. Whoever eats sour grapes, their own teeth will be set on edge. Thus, for example, when David sins, judgment falls on the entire nation. He's the tribal representative. But the time is coming when it will no longer be a tribal representative structure. It won't be that anymore. You die for your own sins. It's not saying that there are no social consequences to sins. Of course there are social consequences to sins. But the tribal representative nature of the covenant will change. So I cannot stand up here and say, God has called me to be a teacher and he has not called you to be a teacher. So let me tell you, know the Lord. I have an inside track, the same kind of inside track that David had, the same kind of inside track that Aaron had, the same kind of track that uh, Isaiah had. And if you claim to be one of these prophets, priests, or kings, uh, when you're not a prophet, priest, or king, then quite frankly, you are usurping the authority of the Lord and you will be under his curse and judgment. I, I can't say that. that. That's why Protestants regularly speak of the priesthood of all the believers. There's no inside track. Do, do, do you see? And in one sense, all of us are supposed to be teachers. We're supposed to be evangelizing, sharing the faith, teaching the faith to our families in, in the context of our local churches. Do, do you see? At some level, it's not a priestly class or a teaching class, certainly not a kingly class. There's rule in the church, but not because there is some class of special rulers in the church called bishops or overseers who are intrinsically superior than and different to other people in the church. So when you look at me as a teacher, how are you to conceive of me? 
not as intrinsically different, but to use Paul's body metaphor, you can view me as a kind of stomach. I take a lot of food in and then I distribute it to the members. <laughs> and in principle, there's, I've just lost all my dignity right there, Do you, you know? <laughs> Every time you look at me now, you'll conjure up in your mind a big, fat, ugly stomach that is distributing food to the rest of the members. And in principle, do you see, you can study too. And in one context or another, whether in your own home or to others, or one-on-one -on -one Bible reading, you, you, you can be a teacher of the Word of God to others. In fact, in some sense, all Christians are supposed to be teaching the Bible to, the, to, to, other, to other people. But I don't have a special mediating role, because in those days, under the terms of the New Covenant, no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least to the greatest. And then there is utter forgiveness. Well, of course there's forgiveness in the Old Testament. That's why there was a sacrificial system. God in the Old Testament forgives their sins again and again and again. But ultimately, when you come to the epistle of the Hebrews, here there is a certainty and a completeness to forgiveness because there is no more sacrifice for sins. All those animal sacrifices cannot possibly be thought intrinsically effective. The bull on the Day of Atonement does not come up to the master and say, go ahead, cut my throat. I'm willing to offer up my life as a sacrifice for you. Do you see, there's no moral intrinsic value to the sacrifice of the Day of Atonement. None. Absolutely none. Which is precisely why Hebrew says the blood of bull and goats can never save. Instead, there is a God-ordained sacrifice that points forward to the ultimate morally significant sacrifice, the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. And he dies once for all. And in consequence, there is no more sacrifice for sin. I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. Small wonder then on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. He's claiming to fulfill, to enact, to bring to pass the new covenant as described by Jeremiah chapter 31. And then, the people of Israel will be preserved in consequence, verses 35 to 37. In astonishing language, God says, the one who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and stars by night, who stirs up the sea, absolutely sovereign over the universe. Listen, he declares, God says, only if these decrees that govern the entire universe vanish and the whole universe collapses somehow, only then will Israel ever cease being a nation before me. Now, you must not understand the word nation to mean nation as a nation state, the way we think of the term nation. Nation as nation state wasn't invented until the 18th century. But as my peculiar people before me, God's peculiar Israel remains his people forever. And put within the whole framework of redemptive history, that's the equivalent of saying, I will build my church, I will build my assembly, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Only if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below be searched out will I reject all the descendants of Israel because of all they have done. No, there'll be a remnant. There'll be a remnant that will continue part of this sweeping movement of the people of God until the end. And finally, there is a promise of a stable Jerusalem. Verses 38 to the end. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when this city will be rebuilt. And then the description of the city is, briefly encompasses the next two or three verses. The city will never again be uprooted or demolished. There is already in the Old Testament what might be called a Jerusalem typology. Do you remember how Ezekiel ends? Ezekiel ends with this vision of a an artificial but deeply symbol-laden new temple built in New Jerusalem. And, and the name of the city at the very end of the book is called, The Lord is There. So already Jerusalem takes on almost mystic significance in the Old Testament. It's the place where the Davidic dynasty 
is established. It's the place where the temple is built. It's the city of the great king. It, it's the high point, the, the place to which not only Israel but the nations go in order to offer their sacrifices. Do you see? So the day comes, Isaiah says, when, when the Assyrians will come and the Egyptians will come and there'll be Israel my third and Assyria my third and gathering in Jerusalem. Just empirical Jerusalem? Oh, Paul understands when he insists in Galatians, back to Galatians again, Jerusalem that is above is free. We gather around a city set on a hill. We're not gathered around Sinai. Read Hebrews chapter 12. We're gathered around the new Jerusalem. Until finally, one of the many, many, many symbol-laden metaphors to talk about what the new heaven and the earth will be like is found again in that closing vision of Revelation 21 and 22. I saw a new, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. So it, it has its origins in God. It's a, it's a social vision. It's not just that individual Christians are saved. It's a, it's a social vision, a, a working city. But that it's symbol-laden, it's transparent. It's, it's built like a cube. No city is ever built like a cube. And there's only one cube in the Old Testament in any case. So it's a way of saying that the New Jerusalem is basically the most holy place. The place where God is. No wonder the seer says, I saw no temple in that city, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. How can you have a temple within the most holy place? The heart of the temple is the new Jerusalem. We are gathered there with the great king, with 12 gates and 12 foundation stones, apostles, Old Testament tribes, the new Jerusalem. And already the foundations of such symbolism are here, established in the language of the new covenant. So now let me read again verses that I read this morning in another connection. 1 Peter chapter 1, 10. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Let us pray. So we too, we confess, long to look into these things. We confess we are a most blessed people. Precisely because we live this side of the cross and the resurrection. We live under the terms of the new covenant, now enacted, already envisaged by Ezekiel and Jeremiah, six centuries before Christ. We thank you for the old covenant, the covenant of Sinai that preceded it. We thank you for the Abrahamic covenant that established the promises of grace even before that. All of these things working together with language that is progressively ratcheted up as both your judgment and your grace become clearer and clearer and clearer until they come to resounding, clashing climax in the cross. O oh Lord God, open our eyes that we may see and in consequence bow in worship and holy joy and reverence and obedience and faith. Grant that we may learn these lessons ourselves and then learn how to teach them to others that they too may see. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Carson, uh, for closing with a word from the Lord for all of us.